there are children of God and there are mature sons and daughters of God. And it takes time to become a mature child of God. It's just like being young, you're a child, and then you gradually get older, and then you become an adult, you become more mature. Hello. It's pretty full here tonight. Hallelujah. Well, let's keep our hearts open to the Lord. Praise God. When I was praying this afternoon, I felt, you know, the Lord speak to me. He's saying, I, I want to awaken destiny in people's hearts tonight. Now, this is a speaker that, um, he, he passed away uh, about a month or two ago. But um, he used to have regular visits from the Lord and from angels. He's uh, been caught up in the spirit so many times. He's been to heaven. He's been, the Lord took him down into hell. Um, the Lord would come and sit and talk with this man. I mean, he was, he was always doing something with, with God. He was, uh, so this is someone who knows God very, very well. And uh, he fulfilled his destiny here on earth. And um, now he's with the Lord and he's working for the Lord um, in, in heaven now. So this is a, this is a man that um, had uh, daily visitations from angels and from the Lord. His name is Neville Johnson. And I thought about that, prayed for that for a while, you know. You know, perspective is really important. It really is important. If I had a little tree the size of my hand and there was no background to it, you could not tell how big the tree was. It could be a hundred feet tall or it could be this foot. But without background and perspective, there's no way of you telling how big that tree is. I said that in our Christian walk. Unless we have the bigger picture, unless we see the bigger picture, we can't fully enter into all that it's got, has, got, has got for us. And so, I want to give something of a bigger picture tonight and um, give us some understanding. The bigger picture. How many of you know graduation is coming? We're running out of time. And graduation is coming. You know, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 23, it says, Say that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things, Paul said, move me. I don't count my life dear unto myself in order that I might finish my life course with joy finish my course and then and the ministry which I have received of the Lord two things there finishing my course and the ministry which God has given me why are you here I'm not me I don't mean here here why are you here on this planet? Why are you here? You know, sometimes they use shock treatment for people who have um, mental problems to break up old patterns of thought, you know? It's kind of a brutal thing. They don't do it much anymore. But, but sometimes Christians need shock treatment to break up the old patterns of thought and reorientate them into the real thing. You know? If you don't know why you're here, you cannot properly fulfill your purpose. People just drift through life, you know? Not reason why they're here. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm called to be a, the best housewife on this planet. 
a moving God in everything I do. I'm here to be an intercessor. Oh, God's called me to be a missionary. I'm not talking about that. That's not why you are here. Hello? I think we're going to kill some sacred cows tonight. <laughs> you know? I'm talking about the fundamental reason why you are here. The real thing, the fundamental reason why you are here. You know, humans have been on this planet for around 6,000 years. Don't tell Darwin that, but <laughs> humans have been on the planet for around you know, 6,000 years. The planet, of course, is much older, but, you know, but the kingdom of God has existed for eons and eons before this planet was even created. A vast kingdom. It was in existence. The kingdom of God. So when I'm talking about, you know, when people say, well, I'm called to be this, I'm called to be that. Well, there's some truth in that. But we tend to mistake our basic and central calling and purpose for our secondary calling. And I'll explain that to you in just a moment. If we fail in understanding our purpose from being here, we start our Christian life on the wrong foundation. In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24, it says, Know you not that though those which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you might obtain. Okay, run that you might obtain. He's talking about your life. And he's aligning it now as, a, as running a race. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses who've run their race. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now what race is this? It's not just making it to heaven. You know, run my race, I finish the course, I die and I go to heaven. No. A lot of people don't finish their course and go to heaven. Hello. You know, why did God put you here? There are millions of planets throughout the universe, right? Why are you here on this planet? Particularly in this generation, the last one. Why are you here? Your existence here has been designed with a specific purpose in mind. You know? In a sense, planet Earth is a, univer is a university for the making of sons of God. This one planet. It's hard enough, it's difficult enough, it has the right conditions for the making of sons and daughters of God. And he's purpose that you're here in the finest time ever in the church. It's not just making it to heaven. That's not the prize. Paul talks about the prize of the high calling. I pressed towards the prize. What was that? What kind of prize was that? You know? 2 Timothy 4, 7. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. He knew he was on a course. He finished it. This race or this course is not who gets across the line first. It's he who endures to the end and finishes the purpose for why he was put here. That's what we're talking about. You know, the children of Israel in the wilderness, were a, the Bible says they were an example to us at the end of the age. The scripture talks about that. 
But many of them, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10.5, many of them, God was not well pleased. And they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, Now all of these things happened to them for our example. Then he goes on to say, They are written for our admonition, us whom the worlds of the end have come upon. Primarily written for this generation. So what happened? Well, they were saved. They were all saved. You know, positionally saved. They came, they came through Passover, the blood of the Lamb, out of Egypt, into the promised uh, into the wilderness. No, we don't tell new converts that once you get saved, you're going into a wilderness. And that's what it was about. They came out into the wilderness. They went 50 days to a place, a mountain, high in the eye. 50 days speaks of what? Come on, Pentecost. You know, Jesus said after he rose from the dead, wait for me 50 days, 40 days, 10 days, 50 days, and then the day of Pentecost came. And so they were Pentecostals. They were classic Pentecostals because they complained about everything. <laughs> well, Pentecostals. The cloud moved on. They got right to the point where they could see the promised land. And would you believe most of them, a whole generation, didn't make it? We have a whole generation of Pentecostals, you know. Ten, twelve spies, ten spies went out into the promised land. Five of them came back with the wrong message. No. Twelve spies, wasn't it? Yeah, twelve spies. Ten came back with the wrong message and they were all Pentecostals. Think about it. They said we can't go in. It's too hard. There are giants in the land. These other guys came back and said, look what's in the land. Look what's out there. It's worth fighting for. Only two of that generation made it into the promised land. But even then it wasn't finished. They still had to keep going to another place called Zion where there was an open heaven. He said, these things happened to them, Paul said, for our example, so we'll learn from it, us whom the end of the age has come. Wow. The Hebrews 12, seen we are compassed about with such a cloud of witnesses. Those have gone before. Let us lay aside every weight, everything that gets in the way of us finishing our course. And I'll talk to you about the course in just a moment. But seeing, he said, with patience, now run the course. Paul said, look. Paul said, don't stop at Pentecost. You know, we thought, Pentecostal thought, well, we're born again, baptized in water. Baptized in the Holy Spirit, we've got it all. Uh uh. Paul didn't say that. He said, For you were not come to the mount which which touched and burnt with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest. That was Mount Sinai, Pentecost, fifty days out. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words which they had heard and entreated, the word should not be spoken to them any more. They said, we don't want God to speak to us. It's too scary. We don't want to go any further. It's a bit scary. That's what he's saying. They could not endure which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, or shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And terrible was the sight in Moses 
uh, terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. You know, Mount Sinai was erupting like a volcano, and God and the angels were on the top, and God was speaking from the top. That was Pentecost. He said, but don't stop there. That's fine, that's good, but he said, but you now have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God. This is an open heaven. This is what we're talking about. This generation has to go here. Amen. What I'm talking about. But you will come to Mount Zion under the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable com- and to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and God the judge, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. See, there's a cloud of witnesses. There are witnesses here tonight. The spirits of just men who have gone before us and are made perfect, but are here tonight. That we have come to that level of walking with the other side. He said, don't stop at Pentecost. That's not, that's, that's not the end of you. He said, go on to Mount Zion. The judge of the spirits of just men made perfect. See, you've been allotted a certain time to finish your course. That's called your lifespan. Some people finish it early and sometimes God just takes them home because they finish their course. Not a bad deal, you know. They get home quicker than we do. And there's, it's like... This whole planet is a university and you've been placed here to sit a course and finish your course with honors. Graduate with honors. The curriculum is being conformed to the image of Jesus. Learning to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That is your first and prime calling. Everything else is secondary. That is the high calling which Paul had. You said, well, I'm called to be a prophet. I'm called to be an evangelist. Hey, how you do in your first call would determine how well you do in your second. How much you've been conformed to the image of Christ will determine how successful you're in in the second calling, which we call ministry. But Pentecost has had it the other way around. Pentecost had it the other way. The major on the power of Pentecost. And not the nature of Jesus in us. Time for change. How well you do in your first call. Being conformed to the image of Jesus determines how fruitful you will be in your second call. Um, unfortunately, we've majored on the secondary call, believing it was the first call. You're with me tonight. The first call, the high call, is to become like Jesus, to be conformed to his image. Now, the shift is occurring from Pentecost to Tabernacles. We're coming down to Tabernacles this year, and it's a, it's a linchpin time. It's a time of real change. There are seven aspects to the Feast of Tabernacles which are going to open up over the next seven years in great power starting from this Feast of Tabernacles this year. The first one is entering into rest. First stage. They had to come out of their homes and all come together, unity and rest. But we won't go into that tonight. Okay. Tabernacles. It's about coming like Jesus and reaping the final harvest. That's the essence of tabernacles. Being conformed to his image and reaping the final harvest. The final harvest is going to be reaped by a people who are being conformed, who have become like Jesus in their nature. Christ in us, in his fullness, is Feast of Tabernacles. That's what it's about. Our high calling. You see, God wanted and 
still does want a family to rule in his kingdom in the ages to come. You know, we've all been taught we get to heaven and live happily ever after. You know, that's a bit boring. Living happily ever after? Come on. Playing a harp for day after day. We're in training for something bigger than that. Let me tell you something. There is a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. I said that for, did I say that before? Earlier this week? There is a big, big difference. The kingdom of God is universal. It includes the whole of the universe. And it was in existence before we were ever created or before this planet was created. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is God's rule over people in heaven. But that's not the full story. The kingdom of God is... And the requirements for entering the kingdom of God are different from the requirements for entering the kingdom of heaven. Certain people can get into the kingdom of heaven, but but they won't get into the kingdom of God. They'll remain in heaven during the millennium. They will not be ruling on the earth. They're limited to that realm. And which is good, but it's not the best. Really is not the best. There are places, you know, heaven is huge, particularly paradise. It is massive. You could get people the world over ten times into that place. There's plenty of room, but the most room is in paradise, which is the lowest level of heaven. It's big, it's like the outer court, you know, it's a big place. God's primary purpose. See, true Christianity is more to do with developing Christ-like character and spiritual stature than it is simply going somewhere in the sweet by and by. You know? That's how to call thinking. You know, the royal family in England, they are brought up, the royal family in the UK are brought up for one purpose, raised for one purpose, to rule. And there's strict discipline on those kids. You wouldn't believe the discipline. You know, the, the, the kids, Prince Charles and the others, have got to sit on a chair for two or three hours without moving once. Why? Because they're going to have to sit in a chair with dignities, dignities of state and behave themselves without moving. Looking as if they're enjoying everything. It's discipline. They're trained in the military, they're trained in horse riding, they're trained in everything. It is discipline for royalties. So they can handle affairs in other nations with dignity. And it's ter- real discipline they go through. How much more we, when we are in training for ruling? Bible says in Ephesians 1 14 according that he has chosen us that's you in him before the foundation of this world that we should be holy and without blame standing before him you were chosen before this world was even created and part of that choosing would be that you would be alive in this generation Scripture clearly says it. According to has chosen you before the foundation of the world. Before this planet. Ephesians 1.5 Having then predestinated us to the adoption of children by Christ Jesus. Predestinated you. How can I put this? Before you came here to this planet, before God had allowed you to come here, right? To this planet, 
to this university, learning to be trained to rule with him. That's if you graduate, you know. So he allows you to come here and he is seated in your spirit before you even entered the womb. He seated in your spirit destiny, which has to be awakened, particularly in this hour. Destiny, it needs to be awakened. It's in Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that's then the eons to come, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and in earth, even in him, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated for us, according to him that worketh all things after his counsel. Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Predestination. See, Calvinism, predestination. You know, once saved, every saved. You have a choice. You can step out of what God's purpose is for you and go to hell. That's what you want. Predestination is not that God has predestined you. No matter what you do, you're going to make it. It's predestination according to his foreknowledge of you. God knows the end of your life from the beginning of the life. And every choice you will ever make right through your life. And says, there is one that will make it. He doesn't cause you to make the right choices. But he foreknows that you will. And he predestinates you according to his foreknowledge of you and sows destiny into your spirit. Isn't that exciting? Doesn't take away your free choice, your choice of will. Doesn't take that away because he's just that he's seen it before you. He knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. Oh. Now maybe, you know, when you're at university, you're not really working. Well, you're studying. But you're not really working. And you're giving some assignments, right? Yep. Okay. Right now, what God is giving you are assignments. He's training you and giving you assignments and watching how you do. Now, if you don't pass the test... You get to do it again. And if you don't pass it again, you get to do it again. After uh, 10 or 20 times, God looks at this and says, Oh, we'll let you go your own way. See, so the whole planet is a university. It's the one planet in the universe that's capable of producing sons of God. Conditions are just hard enough for us. You know, Job is one of my favorite characters. The Bible says that Job will stand on the earth in the latter days. I've met this guy. He is so full of light you would not believe. It's like, it says in, jo in, in Job 1, 8, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is no one like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man? I would you like God to say that about you. No one in the earth like him. Now we don't know when Job was born. He was born somewhere after the flood, but before the law, that's a big period, somewhere in there. There's not a lot talked about Job except in the book of Job. But God never said that about anyone else in the Bible. Not one person. Only Job did God say that about him. He's a perfect man in all his ways. 
There's no one like him in the earth. And Satan said, oh yeah, but that's all right. You put a hedge around him. That's what he said. Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and all that he has on every side and has blessed the work of his hands and his substance has increased in the land? But no wonder he serves you. He said, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he hath and he'll curse you. And God looked at this guy, Job. Wow. He said, okay, you can do all that to him. But you can't kill him. And there was a day, verse 13, a day when the sons of, and the daughters were eating and drinking in, in, in his eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them, the stolen all your oxes. And killed your servants with the edge of the sword. And I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still telling him this, there came another and said, The fire of God fallen from heaven, burned up the sheep and, ser and the servants and consumed them. And I am the only one who escaped of that to tell you about it. While he was speaking, another one came and said, The Chaldeans have made out three bands and fell upon the camels, carried them away. And slain your servants with the edge of the sword. I was the only one who escaped. So I could tell you. While that one was speaking. There came another said. The sons and the daughters were eating and drinking. in the eldest brothers. And behold there came a great wind from the wilderness. And smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men. And they're all dead. And I'm the only one. Left to tell you. Now what did Job do? It says in the next verse, Job 1.20, Then Job arose, he rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and worshipped God. Passed the test. He worshipped God. He didn't even complain. Now there's other areas where he didn't know what was going on in the book of Job, and his friends weren't any help. But you know, he lost his wife, he lost his children, he lost all his cattle. He lost his house. What would you do? You complain. He got down on his hands and knees and he worshipped God. I bet that made the devil mad. Because the devil would say, oh, he only serves you because you protect him. Well, Joe proved them wrong. You know, Paul, a lot of Christians have forgotten what Paul said in everything, everything, not for everything, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God. If you pass that test, because it's part of the university course for sons of God. But ah, we get to read the end of Job's life. <laughs> in Job 42, 12, so the Lord bless the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For now, at the end of his life, he has 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels. What would you do with 6,000 camels? And a yoke of oxen and a thousand female asses. He also has seven sons and three daughters and then all the land where no woman found so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. And after this, Job lived another 140 years. And he died seeing four generations of children and grandchildren. When things were really going bad in Job's life, he said this. In, in Job 19.25, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. How did he know that? This was way back before Jesus was even known. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and I shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Wow. And though after the skins and 
after my skin and worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I will stand before the Lord. Whom I will see for myself, and my behold another, even though my body is dead in the grave, I shall stand before the Lord. This was Job. How did he know all that? Job also knew that the globe, the, the, he had some incredible revelations. He knew that planet Earth was a globe long before we caught up with that, you know. We thought the world was flat. We would fall off the edge if you kept sailing. Job didn't, he took hanging in space. Okay. book of Job is there to tell us what it's about. You see, you come into the kingdom of God, you get born again, and everything's fine for a while. Everything good, right? You're excited until Satan is saying, yeah, yeah, okay. You're blessing him, everything's fine. If that was taken away, he won't serve you. So what does God do? He lowers the hedge around you. When God lowers the hedge, see, we don't tell you converts this. We lie to them. You come into the kingdom of God. It'll be good for a while, but you're in training. It's going to get rough. He lowers the hedge and you get whacked. By the enemy, right off your feet. You don't know what hit you. What was all that about? Where is God? You know, I thought this thing was a glorious walk with God. It is. But there's some things to learn. So he gets back on his feet. Think, Whoa, what was that? A few months later, whack, he goes down again. God's just lowered the hedge. What's he trying to do? He's trying to teach him how to defend himself and put on the armor of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. So he's thinking, oh, now how did the enemy get ground to do that in me? How did he knock me down like that? I've got to close that doorway. Hey, growing up now, he's learning to put on the whole armor of God breastplate of righteousness that's a process you know of being knocked off your feet so many times until you get up and learn to put it on you know what I'm talking about because you've been through it see we lie to new converts he said okay now you're in school of hard training hard knocks First thing you've got to do is when I lower the hedge, you've got to stand on your feet and get used what I've given you to stand before the enemy and stand before the Lord. God lowers the hedge. He did with Job. Satan said, I just lower the hedge. You put a hedge around, but take that hedge away of protection. And you know, if a person comes to the Lord and it's had kind of a honeymoon season for a while, and then the hedge goes down. This is the school we're in. This is this training. This planet is just right for training sons of God. That's just hard enough. There are just enough demons. <laughs> Set up this situation for us so that we can overcome. And stand on our feet before the Lord. See, we should tell new converts, right? You come into the kingdom of God and you'll be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's going to be hard because there's going to be a series of tests and you're not going to get it right every time for a while. And it's going to be hard. But we try to shield 
Let them get knocked over. And then tell them why they got knocked over. How to defend themselves against that. See, you're in a school. And the problem is we've got... You don't have a whole lifetime left to finish the course. Because we're the last generation. So things are heating up real quickly. You gotta pass the test. Pass the test. Just like Job. You know, nobody told me these things in Bible school. The gospel of the kingdom, which is the gospel we're gonna start preaching. The gospel of the kingdom is come to the kingdom of God and die. And you won't have a life anymore of your own. Tell them up front. They'll rise to the challenge, you know. This generation of kids need a challenge. They need to know why they're here, where they came from, and where they're going. The school systems have destroyed all of that. Evolution destroyed it all. They need to know who they are, why they are here. Where did they come from? What's the purpose for them being on this path? This gospel of the kingdom have got to be preached to this generation. Amen. It really has. You know? And we must start preaching the right gospel. See, God is preparing us for roles. First in the millennium. The rule with him in the millennium reign of Christ. You know, in the realm, we're going to have a, a, a planet with perfect conditions during the millennium because it's going to be shift of the planet on its axis. There'll be perfect climate, no more storms. It'll be incredible. And he's, he wants to teach his people. You see, this is another training ground, is the millennium. It's a training ground for the next real thing after the millennium. We need architects in the millennium to recreate cities again from what we've seen in heaven. Build them according to the plan. You know, we think the millennium is all spiritual and we rule, but you know, you're going to have to build cities, build roads. There's transport. There's got to be ministers of all kinds of stuff, including music, arts, everything. And when they're not getting it right, God comes and say, come, come up here in heaven, I'll show you how it's done. Now go back down and do it this way. That's the millennium. Building a brand new world. Hallelujah. I've seen some architecture in heaven which is absolutely unbelievable. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The millennium is not far away. It won't be long before the last bullet falls to earth after Armageddon. And a brand new world is going to come in. Mind it, it takes seven years to bury the dead, but that's okay. We'll get through that. They put a stake in the ground where, it's, where everybody is radioactive. The Bible tells us that. Put a stake in the ground. Everybody's got plague. They put a stake in the ground. People come after them to bury them. It takes seven years to clean up just the chaos of armaments in the earth. Beating the swords into plowshares. Building a whole new world. Don't look at me like that. This is not fairyland. This is the Bible. There's a new age coming, and it's the real new age. You know? And if you want to be a part of that, I want to be a part of that. Some of the vehicles in there, oh man. BMW's got nothing on them. <laughs> Incredible vehicles. We have.
have to, that was God's first intention for Adam, to bring heaven to earth over this entire planet. That was God's intention. God's going to finish that. And now you're in training. You know? You're sitting a course which you have to finish and graduate, hopefully with honors. And the course is hard. The end of the course is to simply conform us to the image of Jesus. And what ministry then comes out of that will there be ministry assignments, which is our secondary calling. But it's not the first. And he watches how you do in your secondary calling. That's your ministry assignment. But that's not the first call. We've got it the other way around and we've messed it up. See, Peter said, you know, you're in survival school, spiritual end time preface. Survival school. First Peter 4.12, he said, look, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. It's just some strange thing is happening to you. You know, there's doctrines going around today that you shouldn't have any trials. It's called the hyper grace. That doctrine was hatched in hell. Don't tell the truth, right? It's purely designed by Satan to wipe out holiness in the church. Big churches, big churches in Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, America. Doctrines of demons. <laughs> Gotta tell you, don't get involved in it. It's very subtle because there's some truth in it. The devil never just brings deception. He brings some truth in a lot of deception. I wasn't going to say that, but it's really important. You really need to know. Don't get messed in that, 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 that kind of church whatsoever. It'll destroy you. You will not be ready for the coming of the Lord if you get into something like that. Hallelujah. Yes. Attitude tests. You know, it says of Hezekiah, it says in, in 2 Chronicles 32, 31, How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon, who sent to him an acquire of the wonder that was done in the land, it says, God left Hezekiah to try him to know what was in his heart. Hey, there are times when God's going to leave you. Leaves you, but in the consciousness of his presence has gone. Why does that happen? How many of you have had that? Suddenly, you can't find God. Anyway, where is he gone? You know, the presence of God, where is he gone? You see, God left Hezekiah to try him to see what was in his heart. And uh, it's an attitude test which you have to pass. It's to get you to trust the nature of God rather than a word from God. Or a conscious presence of the Lord. There will be times when he will be put to this test where you can't find God. You have nothing. You can't reach him. The test is this. You trust in God for who he is. Not whether you feel his presence or not. It's an attitude test. You'll go through it. You can't escape it. It'll happen. And you watch your attitudes. Whether you blame God. Where are you? What have I done? <laughs> Once you've passed the test a few times, your attitude changes to treasure of God rather than in a word from God. There's a difference. It's higher to trust in a higher level of faith, trusting in the nature of God. Once you know that God still loves you, God is always with you, whether you feel him or not, you can trust him because he's a loving God. He wants the very best for you. Once that is worked into you, you pass the test. And his presence comes back. See, that's the way it works. God lowers the hedge, you know. 
beloved, think it not strange, the trials. It's not a strange thing for Christians to have trials. The Bible says that. As if some strange thing has happened to you. He said, but when this happens, like <laughs> Job, rejoice. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Trouble is coming. Trouble is coming. You know, just before I went to Lancaster, I got the most incredible toothache. And I thought, oh, great, that's all I need. And the dentist gets in there and starts drilling in. He says, we'll have to do a root canal, but we can't find the fourth root. I got leave from America in a week. And I was in such pain. And I said, Lord, he said, oh, you know, he said, you can't go like this. You can't fly like this because of the air pressure changes. I said, no, Lord. I'm going because you've given me something to say. I'm going. All on the plane, this tooth. Again. When I got up to the pulpit, it stopped. When I got out of the pulpit, it started up again. I started to preach long messages, you know. <laughs> it happened right to the end of the conference, all the way home, until it stopped. You know. Don't think. It's to be expected. You're going to have some trials. You know, that's, that's the making of sons of God. That's what it's about. You, if you get to have somebody doctrine telling you you should never have any trials, that's from hell. And contrary to the Bible, this is New Testament. Peter, don't think it's strange concerning the trials you're going to go. Look at Paul, a day and a night in the water, trying to keep afloat. Left for dead in some places. He was whipped and left for dead. Come on. But rejoice. See, God's going to throw you into the deep end and say, swim. And just when you're going under for the third time, he'll pull you out and say, we'll try it next week again. <laughs> That's where he goes. He lowers the hedge, you know. But Christians, you know, don't learn this. They start blaming God for not looking after them. He said, well, if we finally he deals with us, it's in the course. You know, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. A good man, like Job. A good man. Ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be cast down. Nobody gets through their Christian life by getting it wrong at times. Nobody. Don't look at me like that. You're not that holy. You're going to get it wrong. You're going to fall. But the Lord picks you up again. You can get on with it. See, failure is not in falling down. Failure is not getting up again and going on. That's where failure is. hedge comes down. There's somewhere in your life right now where the hedge is down. You know, you may as well come to terms with it and get it over with. <laughs> you know, if you don't pass the test, God will give you time. If you keep not passing, he then will apply discipline. It's okay discipline. And that can take many forms. If that fails after a while, then he'll chastise you. Every good father will chastise their kids in order to make, help them turn out right, right? If that fails, he'll leave you to your own devices. And you won't finish your course. 
You always still get to heaven. But you won't finish your course. Suffering is part of life. It's not some strange thing. God will set you up, you know, like Job. When God wants to... When God wants you to flourish in the fruit of long-suffering, you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> the only way is to have someone really getting on your nerves. <laughs> you know, we got a saying in Australia, that person really gets on my goat. <laughs> right? Well... It's God's purpose for you to get rid of the goat. <laughs> so he'll bring someone along which really, really is a trial in your life. You know, these impossible people. <laughs> like that. <laughs> impossible people. You think, oh God, get them out of my life. <laughs> no, pass your test. Long suffering, be kind. Be loving, be gentle, be good to them, and God will remove them. He knows just what you need and how to set it up for you. Just like Job, he said, don't kill him. But all these things started to happen. What are your circumstances right now where God is trying to teach you something? Best to locate it, then deal with it and get over with it. You're learning. You're learning to be like Christ, who is long-suffering, gentle, kind. God is incredibly merciful. He really is. Every time ago, I saw these kids streaming into a part of heaven, teenagers, streaming in. And I said to this angel, Why? Where are all these kids coming from? Who are these? And they were in a part of heaven I had never seen before. And it was like a school, big school. And he said, this might rock your doctrine a bit. He said, these are Islamic children who've never heard the name of Jesus but have died. And they were in a school learning about Jesus. God is gracious, you know. He's good to us. He's good to everybody. This is the light that lighted every man that cometh into the world. A person dies without hearing the name of Jesus. The Lord will appear to them at the point of death and tell them who he is and they have a choice. This is the light that lighteth every person that comes into this world with no exceptions. Sure, they enter into a much lower place, but at least they make it. God is good. He's fair. And I want to tell you, they know there's an age of accountability with kids when they come to an age when they're accountable before God. These Islamic kids, some of them were in their 20s. They'd never heard. It was much higher than kids in the Western world. Because they'd never heard anything. They've never been brought up in a Christian nation. They've never heard the name of Jesus. going quietly you know. we need to know what God is like hallelujah every time we receive a prophetic word with it comes a trial who wants a prophetic word God said to Abraham look See all the stars up there? They're going to be your children. Hallelujah. You're going to be the head of father of nations. And then his wife, Sarah, becomes barren. He can't have children. Oh. That's a big, long trial for him. I tried it for many, many, many years. The situation, we know that. Sarah had a child. The 
Okay, that's good. That's a start. Now what about the grandchildren? All right, Isaac gets a wife. She's barren. Can't have children. Where did all this trial come from a prophetic word? You have a prophetic word, it's going to be contested. We think it all oh, look great, let it happen. Joseph has a prophetic word. He ends up with 10 years in prison. <laughs> you know, it's really important how, what a concept of God is, how you view God. Beholding Him, we are changed into the same image, right? Think about that. Your concept of God. It's very, very, how you view what God is like. It's very, very important. Beholding him, the more we know what he is like, the more we will become like that. But if your concept of God is a, a t God is a tyrant, he's willing to smack you down every time you make a mistake, that's what you will be like with people. What we behold, we are transformed into. It says, you know, in the scriptures we talk about idolatry, and it says, they that behold them become like unto them. Idolatry. The big, I've been in nations where people, those they worship, their features are changing with what they worship, conformed. It's a spiritual principle. So be careful if you worship your poodle. <laughs> but it's true. Beholding the Lord, we are changed in that same image from glory, from one level of glory to another. Our concept of God is very, very important. You know, I was told in heaven, and this is what I heard. Know what God is really like. Then, become like that to everyone. Become like God. I didn't say you'll become God. You'll take on the nature of God. Let me say that again. Know what God is really like, then be like that to everyone, and you will become like Him. It's that simple. Transformation through association. You see, in Isaiah 58, in verse 6, it says, Is not this not the fast or the sacrifice which I want from you? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. This is the sacrifice I want from you, is it to deal your bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor that are cast out of the house, when they are naked you cover him, and when you then hide not yourself from the own flesh. Then, he said, if you do this, then your light shall break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Isn't that simple enough? If you, if you do this, then this will happen to you. If you be like God, you'll become like him. That's what it's saying. Then your light shall break forth. Then you shall call upon the Lord and he'll answer you. Thou shalt cry and he's going to say, I'm here. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the putting forth of anger and speaking vanity. Now it says, and if you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, afflicted soul, then shall your light arise in obscurity 
and the darkness shall be like the noonday, and the Lord shall guide you continually. You say, oh, I can't get any guidance from the Lord. Read Isaiah 58 and put it into practice. He'll guide you. And the Lord shall guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and make fat your bones. Well, I don't know about that. And thou shalt be like a water garden and like springs of water. See, it's by grace. He said, if you be like that, I'll be like that with you. But we haven't got much time to be like that. Time is running short. We've got to really get in the gear and redeeming the time we've got now. Be serious with this whole thing. Adam was in a pure world and God put him in the garden to say how he could handle it. And what is your garden today? What has he put you in to, to handle? What's your situation? What's your circumstances at the moment? See, God, <laughs> this school, this course we're taking, is conforming us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it involves test after test after test. When you pass the test, you move on. We've got to learn such things like responsibility. Are you a responsible person? You know? Faithfulness. Are you a faithful person? You say you're going to be there and do that. Do you do it? Decisiveness. Quick to make the yes decisions in God, to say yes to God. Decisiveness, meekness, love, joy under adversity. The joy of the Lord is your strength, you know. Reliability. How reliable are you? Learning not to fight for your rights. you've given them up these things are built into you through tests they don't come to you through the laying on of hands they're built into you through tests but we haven't got a lot of time you know authority is a frightening thing we have to be very careful what we see with the mouth it was a year ago God spoke to me and said my church is full of leprosy church is full of leprosy. Leprosy has to do with a mouth. Criticism. Pulling down others. Miriam, you remember Miriam spoke against Moses and she was turned into a leper just like that. And a leper had to cover their upper lip. They had to shut their mouth. The Lord said to me, that's got to stop in the church. You can't build something up. Don't tear it down. Be careful what you pass on in gossip. God hates gossip. Don't pass it on, even if it's right and it's bad. Do not do it. You become a leper, and leprosy is contagious. What's God trying to establish in you now? What's, what's happening in your life right now? What stage are you at? What's the thing that you need to overcome? If you're going to become an overcomer, there has to be things to overcome. So what is the thing now in your garden? What is the thing in your life right now that you have to deal with? We don't have time to mess around. You have to deal with these things. Hallelujah. You see, once you overcome something, you pass these tests, you have a testimony. Yeah. And how do we overcome in the last days? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We'll be in situations saying, nah, that's not going to work on me. I've had a testimony. I've been there before. I can overcome this. You're not going to get me on that. We have a testimony. Finishing the course. The end result are sons of God conformed to his image and likeness. Seeds have been 
song, which it's like the pigeons are coming home to roost now. For hundreds of years have been away. Seeds have been sown for hundreds of years. They're coming up, they're coming to pass in this generation. That's scary, you know, both good and evil. So sinners are going to get better at sinning. God's people are going to become more right. You see, this is, this is really what it's about. You know, a lot of young people, I said before, a lot of young people, kids, young people have been taken home over the last 20 years. More than, this incredible. We had a very large church in the 70s, really large church. And my wife will bear witness this, the number of teenagers that were taken, kids, were unbelievable. He's died. Good kids, good, not bad kids, good kids who were following the Lord. You know, on, on the 14th of July in 1996, I had a visitation from my daughter. I was in a prayer meeting. I had a visitation from my daughter who died. They died some years before in a car crash. And um, it was like, I said, oh, you know, why, why are you here? She said, I'm just swinging by to say hi, but I'm on a mission. And I said, what is your mission? She said, she was on a mission. S some others like her. Now, she always had a heart for kids, young people. Kids, that was her heart, you know. And um, she'd go to another nation if one of her friends were backslidden in that nation to try and bring them back to the Lord. But she said a plane is going to be shot down on the east coast of the USA on board where lots of young children, people, and lots of children, and lots of, and lots of young people who were Christians. It was some special thing. He said, our mission is to take these children off, take their spirit out of the plane before the missile hits it. I said, you sure? I said, a smile at me. Many of these young people are known to be Christians. I shared this with the church, my church, you know, I shared it. I said, well, okay. Two days later, sure enough, a plane went down on the east coast of America. She said a missile would hit the plane. She said to me that the missile would not have a warhead in it. There were war games going on in that region with, uh, with using missiles which weren't armed. She said the missile would go right through the plane, but it wouldn't explode because there was no warhead on it. She said, just before that missile hits, we'll take them off. Didn't go crazy. And, you know, the whole business of that plane with being shot down was covered up actually happened. It was um, 1996 TWA Flight 800 was shot down off Long Island on the east coast of America on the evening of July the 17th, shortly after the sun had set, while the sky was still <coughs> this Boeing 747-131 jetliner was on a flight, it took off for JF Kennedy Airport for France, Paris and France. On board were 230 people, most young people. The missile went through the plane. Eyewitnesses, almost at one, eyewitnesses were interviewed on radio and TV reported that they, something strange had preceded the explosion of the 747. Witnesses on the ground reported seeing a bright object streaking towards the 747. Other pilots in the air reported seeing the same bright light streaking towards this jet. The FBI interviewed 154 credible witnesses, including scientists, school teachers, army personnel, business executives who, who described seeing this missile. The FBI covered it up because it was being, had been shot down by the military, not on purpose, but by mistake, you know. They were playing war games in 
the region at the sea below. Very interesting, two years ago, the FBI started to investigate this whole thing again and bring the truth to light. Why did this come up again? Because that seed is now going to start to come forth in the church. Myriads of young people are going to be raised up. Myriads of young people. There's no harvest without seed. We don't understand this fully in the ways of God. Myriads and myriads of young people are going to be raised up in the army of the Lord. But at a cost. God takes choice seed to bring forth a choice harvest. And it's like we're right there now, but we have to be ready for this. If you're going to disciple young people, they're going to turn out like you. Well, that's a scary thought. Really? The disciples will become like you. We've got to move real quickly to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We've got to start getting it right. We've got to start passing these tests real quick because they're going to come one after another. And we've got to re ex understand this. Oh, hallelujah. It's time to start growing up real fast. And may need business. Don't be sidetracked. The delay is over. Time is running out. You know, have you ever wondered why certain people in the Bible were very insistent on where they would be buried? Like Abraham, others of him were really insistent where. I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter where you're buried. And Joseph, in Egypt, he made them swear that they would carry his bones all the way up to the promised land. Now that didn't take just a few years. It took more than a hundred years to get those bones there. These were carrying his bones. He was embalmed in Egypt and they carted these bones all the way until they finally got to the place and buried them. Why? Why? Because he saw something coming. The Bible says, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. Talking of Jesus. Abraham saw my day. Joseph saw something coming. He wanted to be buried in a certain place. So when Jesus rose from the dead, the graves would be opened around Jerusalem and the saints would come out and walk all over the place. He said, I want to be a part of that. Carry my bones all the way up what it was about he saw something coming and he positioned himself to be a part of it something is coming you've got to start positioning yourself to be a part of it if we understand this you know the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 22, that this was an act of faith on behalf of Joseph. He said, by faith, Joseph commanded that his bones would be carried there. Why was it? Because he believed it would be raised up in that day. Hallelujah. Awakening destiny. Has saved you to Timothy 1 9. I've saved you. I called you with a holy calling, not according to our purposes, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to you before this world began. Plain enough? He called you, I read it again to Timothy, he saved you and called you with a holy calling. 
not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, his plan, purpose for your life, before the world began. Long before you came to this world. This, by, this verse tells us that God gave you a calling and a purpose before you were born. Jeremiah one five. Behold, I formed you in the belly. I know. I knew you. They formed you in the belly. I knew you before you came forth out of the womb, and I sanctified you and called you then to be a prophet. Before you were born, Jeremiah, I said I gave you this purpose and plan for your life. You know, I have two little, I've got two grandchildren. Well, the teenagers now, but the little kids, they were little kids once. <laughs> really little heard this, they were talking together, real little kids, don't know anything. The older one was talking to the young one. Do you remember before we came here, the trees were different. Everything was greener. They were talking about where they had come from. As they got older, the older one was saying to the younger one, I, I'm forgetting this, tell me again what it was like, where we came from. These are little kids, don't know anything. You ask my wife, too. Then, this whole secular world crowds in on them. And the veil comes down. And it's gone. One time when I was going through some real, real pressure, this man Joe came to me. And he told me his story, some of his story anyway. You know, in the first 37 chapters of Joe, um, Joe was doing his best because he's a good man. But his Lord is complaining. He's saying, I don't know why this has happened to me. What have I done? Have I sinned? And he's too... These three friends went up and they were saying, yes, you sinned. You must have sinned, you know. Sounds like Pentecostal Christian, you know. You must have sinned. <laughs> anyway, he gets through chapter after chapter. We look over, over you. And he went through this with me, you know. And um, chapter 38, God calls him to account. He said, Joe, stand on your feet like a man. I want to talk to you. Now, if God says that to you, you stand on your feet to attention, right? He said, Job 38, verse 4, Where were you when we laid the foundations of this planet? Oh, declare it. God was asking Job, where was he when this world was created? And the question is, where were you? When this world was created. God then defines this period in verse 7. When the morning stars sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. That was when this planet was cre being created. Where were you in this planet? Job 38 verse 21. He said. He goes through a lot of things. Where were you when this happened? This happened. He said. Knowest thou it? Because were you, were you born then? Or because your number of days are great? On the surface, this looks like God is mocking Job. You know, do you know these things because you're old and you were there? But that's not what God was saying. Let's look at it from and three other versions which give a more accurate Hebrew version on this. In Job 38.21, from the NS, NES version that says, You know these things because you were alive then, and the number of your days is great. Hey. The NIV says, Surely, Job, you know, for you were already born. 
And you've lived many years. Living by a book. But of course you know all this. You were alive then and you're extremely old. Kobe explained this to me. You're extremely old, you know. You've been around a long time. But God saw it fit that you would end up on this planet to train, to reign with him, to finish your course, to pass the tests. Saved us. To me, they said, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but which was given to us before this world began. So we're going to see there was seeded in your spirit a plan for your destiny, and all of the provision to fulfill that plan was set aside for you. That's what the Bible says. You've still got time. Fulfill it. Pass the tests and get on with it. This world is not your home. You're on a mission. This is not your home. This is not your citizenship. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's where you came from. And he said, but Job, stop complaining about it. You were happy to come here. Now what's your problem? That's what he was saying. That's exactly what was happening. Not all who come fulfill their mission. Our mission is to bring heaven to earth. Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate. Oh. See, this is the bigger picture. This is the bigger picture. God knew us before you came to this earth. You were predestined to become like Jesus, his sons. This predestination involved learning, passing the test, coming in, and all of those things we talked about. But that seeding, this is what Job told me, that was seeded in his spirit, the purpose and plan for his life, his destiny. And he said it was only when God confronted him, that it all came back to him. You know, there have been times when you've been in a movie and something happens and you start crying, you don't know why. Have you ever had that experience? Because something that was either said or is happening touched your destiny. And the emotional response. You hear some music or a song or something. It affects you. There's an emotional response. It doesn't have to be Christian. It could be a secular song. There's an emotional response. From what's that about? What it touched? Just, just a faint memory touched your destiny. And there are ways that that is just sparked at times. You think, oh. Yeah. You know how that feeling, you know what I'm talking about? When I saw the movie Avatar, I thought, I can do that. There's another me on the inside. We can save the world. Serious. Touches your destiny. Sparks something. God spoke to me today and he said, I want to awaken destiny within you, within your people. to remember it's time for that plan that purpose that destiny to begin to surface long forgotten clothed through the veil of humanity for such a time as this to be awakened and to come alive within you you can do that I'm going to pray shortly for this. 
to begin, you know. You know, we bring this conference to a close and then you're on your own again, as it were, for a while, you know. Sure, you've got your own churches and your own pastors again, but you know, there's one thing in a conference environment, there's another thing when you're back out there in the world, <laughs> you know. That's a difference. But I believe God wants to awaken some of the destiny that he seeded within your spirit. That will begin to surface, particularly in young people. That has begin to surface. Begin to surface. Remember Superman, he came from a new planet and he didn't know his destiny, didn't know who he was. Hey, God speaks more through Hollywood when the church is hearing, you know. We have very little time left. This stuff has got to surface. We've got to know why we're here. We've got to see the big picture. We you to end up in the millennium, not just in heaven. Because the millennium then is another training period for a thousand years. And then, God's going to expand his kingdom throughout the universe. Worlds, the scripture says, without end. Worlds without end. Worlds without end. It was God's intention for Adam to bring the kingdom's rule to this fallen planet. He messed it up. We're back again. This planet will become the capital of the universe. Eventually, we'll be spiritualized too at the end of a thousand years to renovate it again and becomes even more spiritualized, the whole planet. This is the voyage out of Star Trek, of the kingdom of God, to go where we've never been before. Can you get this? Really important. Destiny. 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 God wants to awaken this in you. It's time. It is time for this to be awakened within you. He really said to me, if I pray tonight... You'll start to awaken destiny within you once you leave over the next time now, as you go. It'll come in various ways. You'll think, ah, yeah, I was made for that. It's a feeling. It's an inspiration. But it'll start to surface. It's time. Hidden. Deep calls under deep. See, only your spirit knows the things of God, deep things of God. We don't know it here. It's got to be released. Let's stand together, shall we? so many angels here today. Just wait for that for a moment. Just see what this is about. If, if you know, you've got to have the desire and the 
your own desire. You've got to be with it and understanding where we're coming from. And that destiny will begin to be all more of your destiny. Some of it might but it's much more purpose and plan and purpose and destiny be triggered. It'll come to an understanding. It'll come to your conscious mind from your spirit. Understanding that this will happen is that and if this is real and you're sincere, an angel will go with you tonight and he'll cause circumstances to occur in your life. Which will trigger memory where what you were given and you're here. Yeah, a trigger there. And some the way it'll come together so you'll have a better understanding of who why you came here. So that that destiny will be triggered and released into your conscious mind with some understanding. Father, I pray for every person here today. I pray, Lord, that you... God, Lord. You know the desire, our longings, our sins, you know, all the longings of our heart. You know the strong desires in our lives, Lord. These are your people. Lord, they were sent... They are sent, sent here. And although we don't really understand everything, we do understand what your word tells us. Called before the foundation of this world. And I that there'll be an awakening of a sense and clarity of destiny. Peace by peace, triggered peace by Enough circumstances that will trigger it.